So we were having some technical difficulties. So this is kind of part two, and we're going to move to the community garden so she can help provide for her family. And there's a lot of people doing this right now. And uh, in Edmonton, there is a growing community of people who are buying for a community garden space. And Jane has had a community garden plot for quite a long time. I showed in my last video, and I'll put the link up here, that a little tour of a very small neighborhood garden in my neighborhood, which I have a feeling is really small in comparison to Jane's community garden and a mutual friend of ours has just started her journey with the community garden and her plots looked a heck of a lot larger than what I am going to show. I'm going to show my picture uh, and you can see the size of the plots. I think they're smaller than what you have. Yeah, my plot is 10 by 30. Okay, and there's no way that is that. Now the second question I have, um, the garden on your right are, is really overgrown. There's dandelions in it. It obviously has not been taken care of this year. So the question somebody asked, how do you know what plot belongs to who? And if somebody isn't taking care of their plot, is there something that their neighbors can do to alert the city that someone is not taking advantage of what they've been given. Yeah, so I pay $30 for my plot that's 10 by 30. And that plot is assigned to me by the organization that takes care of that particular one, which is our community league. And if I don't plant my plot by June the 6th, then the plot is given to someone else on the waiting list. So I have to have everything cleared out. And if it's not cleared out, if it's still full of weeds, then someone else gets the plot. Great. I'm going to be going back with my camera to this plot just to see if, if it's been cleared. Now, one thing that you might find interesting, Jane, this sidewalk is made of recycled tires. A mutual friend of ours, her company that she's worked for for quite a few years, did this garden as a project to see how well the asphalt landed. And this is over, I think this is about 12 years old now, and you can tell it's been a pretty good success. One thing in my neighborhood, I'm not sure it's in yours, we have raised beds. Uh, there's about four of them of different heights for people with different abilities. This one's obviously been being worked on, but you can see the soil really needs to be uh, augmented. So do you guys bring in your own compost and that kind of stuff? Well, we make our own compost right at the community garden. Okay. And we do bring in a, a large load of manure every year so we can add the manure to our plots and we usually bring in we don't have those paved pathways so we bring in mulch and every year the pathways get an, another layer of mulch after they've been weeded so we have a work bee everyone shows up weeds their pathways puts down the new mulch and then you're free to start working in your garden but my garden would have been run by the organization, I think they call themselves Oliver Peace Garden. And uh, so it's about a quarter block, if that, maybe three house lots for a downtown area. And they get an awful lot in it, but still not a lot. Here's a question I have now. You can see that that's a rhubarb plant. And I was under the presumption that only annuals are allowed to grow in community gardens. Community garden that I am at, our rules that we agree to at the beginning of the year do state we must have everything removed by the fall. Uh, we're not supposed to be planting perennials. Um, I, this is my 12th year at this community garden and 12th or 11th, but anyway, I am one of those boundary pushers. I do plant perennials. 
I do allow things to recede, but I've used the same plot for nine years now. And so I haven't had any slap on the wrist yet. How much food are you getting out of this, out of your home and out of the community garden? How is it realistically helping you with your sustainability as far as the healthy vegetables for your kids? Do you can and dehydrate all of this stuff? Um, it helps in the way that I can create some foods that I like that are harder to find in the grocery store. I do fermenting and I do, uh, I dehydrate, I do freeze. It's not really to supply us necessarily with a lot of food to do over the winter with the exception of the tomatoes that I grow. I grow about 100 pounds of tomatoes in a small space and my kids are Italian, so they need their tomato sauce. So <laughs> it really helps with that. <laughs> That's really helpful to be able to have that homemade uh, tomato sauce. But there's just so many other benefits to be able to teach the kids about life cycles, to be able to have my own herbs that are dehydrated, and then to do other techniques like fermenting, which was one reason why I started uh, gardening here, was, had to do with healing the gut, getting beneficial bacteria into the gut, and doing that with fermenting my own vegetables. So kind of some different techniques that I'm using there. Okay, and before we get cut off, I just wanted to say that go to Facebook. I'll put a link in the description to Jane's Health Adventures. She's got some great stuff on there. Jane works for a health center that is healthy and natural. She's also on Instagram. And uh, what is your name on Instagram? Jane's Health Adventure. That's nice and simple. So look up Jane. She's not on YouTube yet. So <laughs> you guys have got an idea what a urban garden looks like, uh, what you can do. And if you are renting your home, don't be afraid to ask your landlord. That's what Jane did. And, this, and that's what she's growing into. And Jane has started to freeze again. So I'm going to say goodbye from both of us. That's it, Jane. Good work. Okay. See you later. All right. See ya.